Welcome everyone, we will get started in just a second. Great to see so many familiar faces on here. Kathleen, I'm ready whenever you are. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us on this rainy day for a fascinating lunch and learn, I am sure, on understanding fisheries conflict and coexistence with offshore wind energy. This is a particularly timely topic because offshore wind is rapidly becoming a near-term climate solution throughout the Northeast. However, this has generated significant concerns about how wind energy will affect current and future use of ocean space, including for fishing. We are joined today by Dr. Allison Bates, Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at Colby College. Dr. Bates will share how scientists and policymakers are addressing conflict among fishing and offshore wind and discuss the challenges, opportunities, and exciting uh, future ahead. Allison, thank you so much for being with us. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today's event. We will hear from our speaker and then tackle questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I'll keep track of those and ask Dr. Bates in the Q&A at the end. Please message Will Sedlak if you have any technical difficulties and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and we will post the video on our website later this afternoon. You'll also each receive an email with a link to that recording. And just a reminder, you can find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns on the website, including a couple that we've already tackled on Offshore Wind. Thank you again for joining us. And Dr. Bates, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, nice to see everybody here. I really appreciate people taking time out of your day. Uh, can I get a thumbs up from somebody on video, whether you can hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, it's, a, it's a great day to be I'm joining everyone in Zoom. Um, sort of interesting here, um, of course, I'm at Colby College, and we've recently resumed you know, in-person uh, meetings and classes. So it's kind of fun to be back in the Zoom space, I suppose. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get started. Okay, um, so as you heard, um, I'm Dr. Allison Bates. I um, have been with Colby College, well, I guess it's technically my second year, but non-consecutively. Um, and I'm gonna talk about one area of my research um, here at Colby, uh, which is part of kind of a, a broader uh, research program that the college is investing in right now around equity in the energy transition. And this is a really hot topic not just here in Maine or even in New England um, or even in the United States, right? Worldwide, we're thinking about massive energy transitions and um, how do we really solve the climate crisis? Well, it's not just through an energy transition, but that's one of the major facets. And as you know, anytime we're um, looking at making transitions, there can be winners and losers. And if, we're, if we don't pay close attention to that at the beginning, uh, we really risk exacerbating inequities and inequalities. So I've been very interested in how do we advance a more just energy transition? What are some of those considerations? And one area um, of my work accordingly uh, concerns um, fishing communities and offshore wind. 
So that leads me to um, some of the work that I'll share with you today. So I wanted to start out by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I live up in Waterville right now, and I'm joining you from Colby campus. Um, and I had sort of a circuitous route to getting to Colby, but I actually grew up um, way down in the southern part of the state. Some of you may be joining um, from that area. I grew up on Sebago Lake and spent uh, most of my childhood either out on the water or boating around Penobscot Bay where my family had um, uh, periodically uh, taken some trips to. And so I grew up with a real um, love for the ocean and our coastal environments. And that really has guided um, some of the work and investments that I've made um, into how can we create a better, a better place um, for ourselves in this world. And, you know, after I finished um, under my undergraduate studies, I immediately left New England and went to California because that's what young people often do. Uh, we follow the jobs. And I went and worked in the San Bernardino National Forest doing forestry conservation. And while I was doing that, I learned about the power of community engagement and bringing people into conservation. And that's really shaped the way that my future research um, has sort of materialized into, you know, how do we consider um, you know, people's opinions and um, equity in our transitions. Uh, I did my graduate studies. I studied um, I did my PhD at the University of Delaware as part of the Center for Carbon-Free Power Integration. And I've spent the last number of years um, prior to coming to Colby working with the Energy Transition Institute and the Wind Energy Center at UMass Amherst um, and in partnership with Power US, the Partnership for Offshore Wind Energy, which is sort of a New England-based institution. And I'm very excited to be um, joining here at Colby where this is really the first time we've had a uh, real strong emphasis in energy systems. So I'm mo motivated to do this work, you know, really after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, it was kind of a wake up call, I think, for um, myself and what um, brought me into looking at some of the conflicts of energy in our ocean space. Okay. Um, the energy sector right, is a major driver of greenhouse gas emissions, right? whether we're um, drilling for oil in ocean spaces um, or on land, we're drilling for natural gas. Um, our climate, climate change is being driven largely by our demand for energy systems. When we look at greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector, the electricity sector, right? So just providing electricity is a major proportion of that. But also transportation systems, which are part of energy, um, are a, another major proportion. And um, industrial processes, which often include um, energy, uh, are another um, major faction. So we have significant demand on um, energy systems for sort of powering our economy. And if we're going to solve the climate crisis, we have to address um, our energy systems. And right now, as I'm sure you're all aware, we're making massive investments in transitioning our energy economy. But how we do that is still really uncertain. And it's certainly become um, an issue of policy and politics and communities and how it impacts people. Because we're talking about energy transformations uh, on a scale that we haven't seen in our lifetimes. When I talk to people about energy systems, you know, I, I'm a professor of renewable energy. So I'm often talking to young people and their families um, about energy. And people are often really surprised that we're still heavily dependent on oil, on coal, on natural gas. Okay. Um, renewable energy is still, you know, a fairly small fraction of our energy systems here in the US. Now, this is a larger proportion in Maine um, and worldwide about 25% of our energy is coming from renewables. But overall in the US, it's still fairly low. Uh, but we have seen tremendous growth in our wind sector. Um, a lot of our energy here in Maine, of course, is coming from hydroelectric um, and biofuels. Um, solar has been growing considerably as well. So we're starting to see more and more investments um, in renewables. In fact, <clears throat> renewables, if we look at the energy sector on the whole, here in the United States, renewables um, is the fastest growing energy sector. So for a long time, our largest growth was in natural gas, but right now both um, solar and wind energy have outpaced um, growth in fossil fuels. So this is a really exciting time to be studying renewable systems. 
but we have to think about how do we do that and how do we implement renewables in a way that's equitable. So I've been really interested in offshore wind and I've been studying offshore wind for the past decade or so and looking at sort of different um, aspects of um, offshore wind. And I wanted to share a little bit uh, with you about why we're really thinking about offshore wind, not just here in Maine, but also in the United States. And so for my presentation today, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about sort of the offshore wind context here in the US. And one of our primary stakeholders that we've been talking about um, and concerned with is the fishing industry because of the historic um, use of the, our ocean spaces. And so we'll look at why there may be some conflict um, and what the opportunities for coexistence are. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that I do and some um, future research that we might consider to help improve um, maybe some of the relationships with the wind industry and the fishing industry. So <clears throat> I'm going to show a number of images, hopefully not too much text for you today, uh, but I wanted to sort of share why is offshore wind part of the discussion, right? We're seeing it in the newspapers. I'm guessing that many of you are joining from Maine, whether you're reading the Bangor Daily News, Portland Press Herald, or one of the more, the more local papers. Um, we're hearing about offshore wind very frequently. And that's really because there's tremendous potential for offshore wind to play a major role in this energy transition on a large scale, okay? Um, so, this is a map that we often see as, as research scientists, we, we sort of use this map all the time. What this shows is where do we have good windy conditions? Any of you that have spent time out at the coast, you know that it's windier at the coast. Most of the wind development that we've had in the US has been centered here, um, really in the Midwest, right? So we've developed land-based wind throughout the Midwest, a lot of you know, Texas, Iowa, a number of the Midwestern states have really high proportions of um, land-based wind. But it's not reasonable um, or even practical to run power lines from the Midwest um, to the, you know, the coasts. So we have to look at what the opportunities are for renewable um, generation in coastal areas. So in this map, the, the colors are showing wind speed and you can see both of the um, Pacific and the Atlantic coasts, right? These darker colors show higher wind speed potential, right? New England has some of the windiest conditions off of the coast, um, and in particular, the Gulf of Maine, right? So the energy potential, meaning how much electricity can we generate um, from wind turbines is much greater off the coasts than it is on land. The wind also blows um, more steadily Right, and more consistently in coastal areas. So uh, because of the increasing sort of technology developments that we've had and the real potential for um, power generation, especially near our nation's load centers, Boston, New York, DC, um, there has been an increased interest in offshore wind really over the last decade and then really significantly over the past couple of years, okay? So here in the US under multiple administrations, um, so um, you know, in different political contexts, there has been a push to increase um, renewable energy overall and specifically earmark um, increases of offshore wind energy to help us meet some of our energy goals. Some initial um, estimates from the US Department of Energy um, indicated that we could meet anywhere from one to 5% of uh, our energy from it here in the US by 2030. Well, that's probably not going to happen. We might not be on track for that. Um, and those numbers have sort of shifted as um, you know, different um, uh, policies and different um, political regimes have uh, come into power. But overall, there's been some of these goals which are incentivizing energy developers to um, in sort of increase their um, technology and think about ways to um, develop offshore. So some of you may have seen this map as well. This is put forth by uh, what we call BOEM or the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. This is the federal agency that's responsible for offshore wind leasing and primarily um, the regulations around offshore wind um, in federal waters, not in state waters. In this map, 
they've identified, when this gets um, periodically updated, but this map identifies the different wind energy areas that have been sort of earmarked for development. Now, as you probably know, we only have two sort of functional offshore wind farms in the United States. Um, we have one off of the coast of Rhode Island. Um, it's called the Block Island Project. There are five wind turbines there. And then there's a um, small, smaller scale project off of Virginia that has recently um, been grid connected. So these other areas that you can see, right? They're just um, in, in these different colors and they have their names attached are areas that the federal government is um, either has received a bid from a private company to um, lease the space, or the um, federal government has decided that this is a good area for development and they are going to put out a call for bids, okay? So <clears throat> this really shows you where most of the early offshore wind development in the US um, has been concentrated. Southeastern New England, okay, um, mid-Atlantic, and a little bit off of the coast, uh, the southern coast, although the wind isn't as strong there. And notably, you don't see anything here in the Gulf of Maine. And that's, there's several reasons for that. Um, one of them has to do with the um, depth of the water in the Gulf of Maine. But of course, that's changing, um, not the water depth, but the interest, because our technologies have really changed over the past 10 years or so. So we're starting to see um, increased interest and, of course, um, a push from our state. And I just wanted to zoom in on one of these maps to give you an indication. If you haven't looked at some of these maps of wind energy areas before, um, this shows you sort of what the, what the framework is for um, some of these wind farms that have been in the news. Notably, you, um, vineyard wind, which is sort of this yellow earmark here, has been in the news a lot and specifically related to um, the fishing industry, okay? Uh, and some of these other areas have were in the news, I would say, you know, in the last um, several years, as we were thinking about where near term um, wind farms might go, and whether or not they conflicted with um, some um, fishing areas. So, in the past, we used to really think about the limitations for offshore wind as being technology driven or cost, okay? The costs of offshore wind have come down significantly. A lot of that is due to state level um, goals. So in absence of federal policy, um, many of the New England and mid-Atlantic states have set offshore wind targets, which has driven off um, market competition. And that market competition essentially is gr granting a lease of ocean space to the lowest bidder. Okay, so um, it's really brought technology costs down significantly. Okay, um, so the cost issue isn't as much of an issue anymore, right? It's still maybe a little bit more expensive, but it's much more cost competitive and on um, par um, with fossil fuels in some instances. We also used to talk about offshore wind as being sort of technology limited, right? That the technology was really nascent and really new, and we didn't have the means or really understand um, that development very well. This image shows some of the different types of ways that we can install uh, wind energy in the ocean. Most of Europe, where we've seen, you know, most of our offshore wind development worldwide, has implemented this shallow water or monopile type of foundation, right? So this is in fairly shallow waters, um, very similar to a land-based wind turbine. It's just in, in kind of a near shore area. In slightly deeper waters, and such as what we see in the Block Island project off of Rhode Island, we get these sort of what we might call a jacket foundation. Uh, and this is really a design that's derived from the oil rigs out of the Gulf of Mexico. And then in deeper waters, right, we were looking at floating water or uh, floating turbine technology. And for a long time, this was sort of a pipe dream that this would be a reality, but um, Increasingly, this is becoming um, something that's actually happening. There are floating wind turbines that are in operation and being tested um, around the world. So those aren't our limitations to the same extent. I was trained first as a biologist, and then I really continued my studies into um, uh, marine and energy policy, because I really see these social barriers as 
Um, one of the key challenges that we need to address and solve if we're going to overcome the climate crisis. And as much as we like to talk about energy systems as being sort of a technology challenge, I really maintain that it's regulatory challenges and primarily social issues that are holding you know, this back, right? That we haven't, and, it, and it's not that, um, that that's a problem necessarily, but if we're not properly accounting for the ways that communities are being affected and what some of, and identify some of the opportunities for improvement um, in those engagement strategies, then we're not going to solve the climate crisis. So um, some of my early work really looked at sort of social acceptance and how are we thinking about, you know, who's supporting energy systems and who isn't, um, which led me to understand and, and study more um, about fisheries. What you see here is sort of an iconic picture from the Cape Wind Project. Some of you have probably seen this before, uh, where you have both um, opponents and supporters um, around that project. Of course, that project failed, was officially canceled um, several years ago. And in wind energy um, circles, we often sort of call it the project that shall not be named, but it really brought to light some of the challenges um, that come up around uh, offshore wind. And those challenges haven't really been solved yet. So this leads me to um, some of the work that I've been doing, where we're thinking about sort of a crowded ocean, right? We often think of the ocean as um, sort of very large, which it is open, right? Not busy, um, but it is busy. There's a lot of activity um, out there, whether it's for people, you know, working, working waterfronts or people recreating on the ocean. It's, a, it's an increasingly busy space. And of course there's future demand on ocean space for energy development, not just offshore wind, but other types of energy development too. So how do we develop low carbon energy in a way that considers equity to ocean users? So this has been sort of driving some of the research that we've been taking on here in my lab at Colby. And so I'm gonna talk, um, spend a little time looking at sort of how um, the fishing community as sort of a key um, ocean user, right, and key constituent has um, the potential to be impacted and how we might be able to um, use science and data to come up with better solutions, okay. Um, and so we know that there's potentially really large gains or losses to both industries when they come into conflict, right. Uh, people are deriving their uh, benefits and their, their livelihoods from the ocean. Okay, um, there's potentially large losses there, right? If we don't do this right. There's also large economic gains through the provision of energy sources. So you're sort of unwittingly sort of pitting two economic, um, uh, uh, two economic activities against each other, right? The fishing industry is, is a high value industry in this state, in New England, Okay. not just to the, the fishers and the people that are on the water, right? but all the way back to the supply chain, working waterfronts, right? um, and processors and distributors and all the different people that are a part of the um, fishing industry. Right? So this is a very important, this is not a kind of a small faction. And this is not just true in New England or in Maine. Right? This is true um, throughout the United States. Right? Um, it's a valuable and important part of our food source. Fish species themselves have the potential to be impacted from this industry. And there can be spatial conflict between fisheries and offshore wind, meaning that they both might want the same space. So how do we minimize that? Well, I'll tackle the first one first, Think, looking at um, sort of the environmental impacts. This is the easy one. Uh, we've been studying for a long time, what are the um, potential implications for different wildlife species? Most of the research has come out of Europe from the existing wind farms. Um, the ecosystem is not the same, but there are some lessons that we can learn. So one of the things that we know is that when we put power cables in the ocean and when we um, bury them under sea, there's an electromagnetic field. You can see some examples of power cables and, and mooring lines with power cables in this schematic. This is not an actual photo, right? Um, and then this 
image here on the top shows what it looks like when you might have um, wind turbines here in the ocean and then a power cable that's coming back to shore. So some species um, are not bothered by these electromagnetic fields and others um, might stay away. Um, electromagnetic sensitive species like sharks, rays, et cetera, um, may be impacted. Burying the cables deeper into the seabed is one way to mitigate that, okay? Um, but that's been a concern that has come up um, uh, over a number of years. We can also look at the fouling on a, a wind turbine foundation itself. Now, this is really going to vary depending on the foundation that's used. Um, here in Maine, of course, we're looking at floating wind turbine foundations, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, but most of the research has, has looked at multiple years, right? What types of species are colonizing around um, turbine foundations on themselves? And then are they attracting fish? And what type of fish, right? So in Rhode Island, we're finding that a number of fish species are attracted to the wind turbines, um, which has really attracted the fishing community, mostly on the recreational side. And it's increased crowding at those turbines. So that's one of the considerations that um, are being made. What I'm most interested in are some of the um, sort of more social interactions, the, the spatial interactions, right, among fishing um, vessels and wind turbines themselves. So the question that comes up pretty much all the time is, um, are we going to be excluded from wind turbines? Um, so when we install a wind farm, right, it's typically not cost beneficial to install just one or two turbines. We're typically talking about an array of anywhere from maybe five turbines, 10 turbines, 100 turbines or more. Okay, so these could be, these could be small or they could be very large. Um, you certainly get economies of scale. So on the developer side, there can be an incentive to build larger wind farms, which are a collection of turbines together. So whether or not fishing vessels are able to navigate through those arrays and actively fish through those arrays has been a hot topic for at least a decade, if not more. And a lot of this was sort of spurred by precedent that was set in Europe where fishing activity was completely banned um, from a number of wind farms. And that was done for sort of multiple purposes. One was to help rebuild ecosystems. Um, it's been very explicitly stated that that's not going to be the case here. It's actually written into federal law that um, oh, it, you know, oh, a wind farm developer that has the right to develop the seabed does not have the right to exclude anybody from sort of navigating um, or engaging in activities in between those wind turbines. Okay, they do have the right to actually stop people from tying up to the turbines, but that's it. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be what we call a de facto exclusion, which means even though they may not be legally prevent, prevented from fishing within an array, it's possible that, you know, due to either the turn radius of a vessel or safety, um, that there might be a reason that those fishing vessels cannot actively fish or cannot safely transit. Um, through wind farms. So that's really been the crux of the issue, okay? And we know that if we're displacing fishers from their prime fishing grounds, where well, they may incur costs from increased effort, meaning they're out on the water longer, they're going out more often, spending more on fuel, away from their families more often, or maybe they're going to have lower catch, right? So reducing the revenue. Um, and for vessels that operate at slim profit margins, this can be devastating, okay? So some of the specific um, issues that often come up in either newspaper articles or in public comment that we see um, and some of the considerations we need to make are, well, um, how big is, the, is each fishing vessel? Okay, they're not all the same. Some are able to turn and operate uh, much more nimbly than others. Um, what, do, what do the cables look like coming off of these wind turbines? Okay, a floating wind turbine with cables that are suspended in the water column, it's very different than um, the type of wind turbine that you see right here in this image with a kind of a fixed base foundation where your cables are going to be completely submerged. Okay. 
time. Uh, we have to think about navigation under poor um, visibility conditions and potential with radar interference from the blades, okay? Um, and then some of the crowding and competition with recreational fishing. So all of these things are challenges that have come up that we're as sort of multiple communities of people, whether you're into conservation, whether you're in policymaking, government, um, scientists, right? We're all thinking about how do we solve specific parts of this puzzle so that we can um, improve relationships and um, not just try to um, increase acceptability of wind farms, right? That's, that's sometimes the rhetoric that's out there, but um, how do we maximize benefits to both industries so that we can address the climate transition in a way that is more equitable? Um, <clears throat> one of the other um, points that I wanted to make is that when we talk about fishing communities, right, they're not monolithic. And anyone who's sort of worked with fishing communities knows this, but um, I think we often are talking, when we say fishing community, we're sort of lumping everybody together. But fishing communities, whether you're in Maine, New England, or beyond, um, have really, are really different. They use different types of gear, different types of vessels, different species, um, under different uh, regulatory systems, right? And the way that they're going to be impacted from wind is not the same, okay? Um, if you're dropping traps down in the water column versus towing very large nets, um, those are going to be um, impacted in different ways, All right? And so fishing communities have voiced concerns about offshore wind for a long time, right? This is not a new issue. Um, I'm coming back to this map that I showed um, earlier in my presentation because I wanted to share one of the ways that the voices of fishing communities have actually impacted um, and I think benefited um, <clears throat> our understanding of how do, we, how do we lease ocean space in a way that's more beneficial. And so uh, when the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management originally proposed some of the, uh, what we call wind energy areas, okay, this area up here in sort of the upper um, left corner used to include this entire sort of zone here, right? And after this proposal went out for public comment, um, communities got, were really concerned because this uh, area that's not part of a wind energy lease, which was originally um, included, is a major transit corridor for um, fishing communities and for vessels. And so ultimately through the public engagement process, um, we were able to remove this small section of the wind energy areas to um, be able to provide better access for fishing communities, um, even within the scope of pretty large scale offshore wind development, okay? Um, <clears throat> so there have been legal challenges from put forth by fishing communities to um, offshore wind developers. This took place at the Vineyard Wind Project. Um, there were legal challenges under the Cape Wind Project. And then there have also been ethical considerations uh, because this is an industry that has operated for a long time um, out on the coast. And we need to consider how um, different communities might be impacted. Okay, so there's been more and more rhetoric around this, but not always good solutions, right? We've done some surveys. We understand that it's not just fishing communities that are concerned. Um, it's also coastal residents that may not know a lot about this. Um, surveys have indicated of all the things that uh, are most concerning about offshore wind, conflicts with ocean users and fishers are one of the most important um, that, they're, that they're worried about. So some of the research that I do is to help inform wind siting, okay? Um, minimize conflict and maybe maximize benefits to fishing community and wind energy. So I've been working on a study um, with a number of collaborators where we're looking at sort of ocean space. Um, this map here shows um, kind of all of these squares. Those squares, which are larger here that you can see, are what we call OCS or off Outer Continental Shelf Lease Blocks. And so we're looking at and sort of a lease block by lease block basis, right? What is the value of that to the wind industry? And how important is that to the fishing industry? Um, and are there ways that we can identify the highest value kind of wind sites, meaning 
um, lowest cost and highest amount of energy production and avoid those areas um, and also identify the highest value fishing locations and avoid those spots in the um, proposal of offshore wind sites throughout whether it's the mid-Atlantic or this, this is a framework that can be applied really anywhere. So we, in any given space in the ocean, we can actually calculate the possible energy output from different turbines. So we've built a spatial model where we can put in all kinds of energy data, um, thinking across 25 years, plus a couple of years to build and decommission. And we can identify how much energy we can actually obtain from that one specific spot in the ocean. And then we can also look at what the costs are to build that in that spot. Whether it's, um, you know, we can vary this depending on the foundation. Um, whether you're looking at the installation costs or transiting or maintenance or laying um, cables, right? We can actually calculate these costs to get a, um, a cost per unit energy, right? Or we call this a suitability model. And so we can apply this in lots of different ways where we're ultimately saying, okay, these areas are lower cost. And as you sort of change in color here, what you're seeing is an increase in um, cost per megawatt hour, right? Cost per unit energy, right? So we can vary those inputs and apply this really at, in any geographic location. And we can then compare that with fishing industry, right? Um, so this is an example taken from the Mid-Atlantic where we looked at a number of species that are really kind of the key landings, right? Um, and then I'll give an example from sort of the scallop and, cl and clam industry. These use the similar types of um, fishing gear, a dredge, which are um, buried into the sediment a little bit and have the potential to interact with buried cables from a wind farm array, okay? Um, and they're also very high value um, species. We can aggregate um, data, which is um, admittedly not great data from vessel trip reports, right? Um, and we can better understand right, where those important areas are on the same scale as we're looking at the benefits to uh, wind energy. So cl the clam fishery uh, includes both quahogs and surf clams. It's fairly high value in the mid-Atlantic and these are what we call sessile species. So they're slow growing and they're long lived. Um, and the scallop industry is sort of similar. It's even higher value industry, but also sessile. Meaning if we develop wind farm arrays where we have species that don't really move, um, we're automatically making it very hard or impossible to fish in those locations. Okay. And then we can develop maps um, with data behind them to help us understand where the highest value um, fisheries are. So this map shows uh, sort of where some of the catch is taking place with the, the red areas being the higher catch areas. Um, so this is scallops, this is clams. You can see that they're different. Um, what's important here is that we think about how we can apply this to different fisheries at different spatial scales. And then uh, um, put this data together and try to understand you know, where, where, what are the areas that have the potential for the highest conflict? And then what are the areas um, where we're unlikely to see conflict over near term, meaning maybe 30 years or so? And let's prioritize um, wind development in areas that are lower conflict, okay? So we can look at sort of high, moderate, and low value fishing zones, high, moderate, and low value wind zones, and then um, pick locations that um, are um, not in conflict with one another, All right? So if we can map our industries together, this can help with our planning process. Um, we can help reduce displacing fishers um, and we can help improve equity, right? And thinking about sort of the overall um, socioeconomic benefits of the industry. And this really fits into the framework of um, marine spatial planning, which is, um, kind of been in fits and starts here in the United States, but having a really comprehensive marine spatial plan uh, where we're not only mapping um, where different ocean activities are taking place, but what, how to prioritize maybe one activity over another could really help expedite this process uh, because there wouldn't always be this sort of question of, well, where could it go? Or, you know, 
how big is it going to be? Um, and so a dedicated planning process that uses data like this could really help um, streamline these processes. Uh, my lab has started some interviews with um, fishing communities to try to understand what some of the attitudes are here in Maine. So I've been back in Maine since um, September of over the past year. And so we've been thinking about, well, how does this sort of framework apply? Um, as many of you know, of course, there's been a lot of discussion around offshore wind and fishing in the Gulf of Maine. And we're finding um, as we're conducting interviews that there are overwhelming feelings of fear and threat from industry, as well as a strong distrust of those motivations of industry, okay? Um, and also that there's this sort of inevitability that there's going to be a lack of community benefits. So one of our goals is to better understand sort of some of the attitudes of fishers and liaisons um, and what those intersections are and how can we improve um, some of our benefits. We also think about this within the framework of energy justice, where there may be power imbalances, right? There's certainly a perceived power imbalance and potentially a real power imbalance, um, but certainly a, a strong faction believe that the fishing community holds less power than maybe other stakeholders or maybe the wind industry, right? Um, there's also a perceived lack of transparency. Sometimes, it doesn't matter if something is perceived or if it's real, right? It's still, um, it's still problematic for communities, right? And we still have to overcome that and we still have to address um, some of these concerns. Right. So <clears throat> I'm going to conclude by um, just showing a couple of slides about um, relating this back to Maine. You know, certainly we're thinking about offshore wind in Maine as in deeper waters based on our regulatory climate. And so there's different technologies that could be placed. There's others that are not shown on this. This is sort of a, um, some of the more common ones that are put forward, okay? Where there's some type of floating foundation and that's because our waters are really deep. And of course the um, governor's um, energy office has been looking at um, how to site a research array. And there are going to be opportunities for engagement. Um, there have been already opportunities for engagement, including um, with uh, different fishing communities. But I think um, moving forward, there will be um, public comment periods and opportunities to learn more about what's happening. But the uh, Maine Governor's uh, Energy Office is going to be um, looking at building a research array. Um, and furthermore, putting together a roadmap of what offshore wind might look like in Maine, which quite frankly, is not as far along as some of the other states in New England. So there's a number of future um, research questions that we can think about. Uh, what are some of these community benefits? How can communities um, identify benefits that are important? We often talk about jobs or direct payments, but those might not be the most important benefits. Right? There may be other issues around workforce development or um, working waterfronts that are more important. Okay. Um, we know that impact and needs might vary among the um, fishing community. And we need to consider what some of the um, location priorities are and if there are ways that we can um, identify maybe better locations. So in conclusion, right, we think that social and regulatory challenges are really greater than technical challenges with offshore wind. And if we look at sort of uses together, maybe we can uh, improve coexistence and reduce some of the conflict and start to think about ways that uh, we can build um, offshore wind arrays to benefit communities overall in Maine. All right, Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you. I guess you probably have some questions that have been coming in. So I'll stop talking. We sure do. Thank you, Dr. Bates. That was just incredible. I, I really appreciate the way you took some really complicated research and, and certainly complicated considerations and, and distilled them out to make it super accessible for us. So thank you. Uh, before we get to questions, I want to share a couple of opportunities for everyone to, uh, to follow up on this conversation today. If you, like me, were sort of 
your interest was piqued by the conversation about energy equity research. I have good news for you. Uh, the follow-up email you'll get later this afternoon has some links to articles about Dr. Bates's work, and that'll be super helpful. Um, you also heard that the offshore wind roadmap and the research array being contemplated and, and planned by the governor's energy office that that process is underway will include a link so that you can sign up for updates from the governor's energy office and stay posted on that and then of course a lot of this work is depend is is not um it's not inexpensive it takes an investment to really transform our energy system and and meet our climate goals and one of the best options that we have to make that investment is to pass the American Jobs Plan. So you will see a, uh, a link in the follow-up email to make it super easy for you to reach out to Senators King and Collins and let them know how important it is to support a full American Jobs Plan. So yes, we love the, the bipartisan infrastructure package that you may have seen some news about yesterday. And we love the uh, the complementary climate and care infrastructure priorities that we still expect to to pursue through budget reconciliation. So, thank you. I will also let you know we had a ton of fabulous questions about. Hang on. All right, uh, about wildlife impacts. You may have noticed that, uh, that we didn't have a lot of questions or, or details from Allison on wildlife impacts. That's because that's not her area of expertise, but I have excellent news for you. And that is that next month, Dr. Damian Brody, who is the um, Agatha P. Darling Associate Professor of Oceanography at the University of Maine and who does have expertise in wildlife impacts of offshore wind and the marine ecosystem, uh, he will be joining us for a, a conversation. So this is gonna be an ongoing uh, lesson for all of us. Uh, all right, digging in. I'm really interested, you know, we, we have, we all bring our own expertise to this conversation as, as stakeholders, as residents, as clean energy policy geeks. <laughs> and, and you as a researcher, you're really focused on balancing these competing interests and understanding those. As a researcher, how do you differentiate between the objections that you hear from, from existing users that are really clearly data-based and those that have political ramifications and those that are, as you said, sort of fear-based or, or just questions of lack of experience, right? Change is hard. How do you weigh the, the categories of comments and input that you hear? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think what's important here is that we're not, um, as researchers, we're trying to be um, very objective in that everybody's voice matters. And um, it doesn't really matter if you're right or wrong. Uh, what, you know, I'm very concerned, I guess, and this is maybe my own personal bias coming in. Um, I think that equity is really driven by um, process, procedural justice, um, fairness in participation. I think everybody deserves um, a, a fair opportunity to engage in the consultation. It, it's not just the fisheries that, uh, or, or fishing communities that might have concerns. And of course, some of our stakeholder groups are very strongly supportive of offshore wind. And in fact, some factions of the fishing industry are very supportive and have been very engaged. Uh, so I think, you know, it's part of our democratic process that everyone has a right to engagement and a right to due process and a right to consultation. Um, I think that, you know, as researchers, we often fall back on data because the, the data can, uh, in theory is unbiased, a way to um, provide balancing. Now, you notice that I didn't, I didn't present, you know, dollars to dollars, right? If we wanted to say which industry is more valuable to our economy, well, that's a really different question. And 
Um, some researchers do try to do that. I think that we risk um, overly weighing maybe one industry over another. And um, frankly, I think we would probably see um, uh, the fishing community like looking like it wasn't as important as it really is because value is not just about dollars. It's about sort of fairness and participation. So um, I think that we're looking for ways to objectively balance um, considerations. And, you know, I don't think it's really up to a researcher to say this is better than this, but that we can use um, and help um, promote and help contextualize um, what some of these considerations are. I know that, you know, there's been a lot of frustration, you know, and if you pull up Portland Press Herald or any newspaper, right, there's been a lot of frustrations that the fishing communities are feeling like they're not being heard. Um, and that's not just in Maine, right? And so um, helping to contextualize um, some of those things as sort of a neutral arbiter, I think is one of the ways that researchers are um, considering weighing these different um, considerations. That is just a super helpful pull back and, and see the big picture. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, what then can, can the advocacy community, this, the planning process, how can we incorporate that sort of neutral uh, view to build a, an inclusive and responsive offshore wind stakeholder process? What do, you, what do you look for? What are the hallmarks of a really good process that uh, we can all feel confident in? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, identifying ways, parts of the process where um, different stakeholders actually have um, a say, and I know that sometimes um, stakeholders are advocating to have veto power, uh, that can certainly be at odds for, um, for governance and for kind of industrial you know, development. But um, identifying really early on for two-way consultation, I think is what's really important here. Um, you know, a lot of consultation with communities tends to be at the inform level, right? And then we're going to tell you about this decision that we've already made. Um, and then you can respond to it, but we've already made the decision. And this is true sort of at the federal level, um, certainly, and, and this is common worldwide, right? But um, this, is really a, this is really presents a challenge for communities that may not have the political power, they may not have the financial resources. So I think that identifying ways early before decisions are fully made is a way to really increase transparency and build trust um, in the process. Thank you. Uh, your position at Colby is specifically about energy policy research. And I think you're the first person to hold a position like that at, at Colby. How did that come about? And, and how are your students responding? That's a great question. I see one of my students on this call right now. Um, so I, I should um, punt it over to him. Um, hey, Ben. Um, gosh, you know, I think that increasingly, you know, even though Colby is a small institution, um, is really seeing sort of the big picture of the climate crisis. And I think that's really where um, positions like this are coming from. It's maybe not that common for small schools to really have an emphasis in some of these more nuanced areas like energy policy. Um, we've had investments in, from what we call from Sandy Buck at the Buck Lab for um, environment and climate. You know, that's been a really important driver of the types of research. There's um, colleagues of mine that focus um, specifically on climate policy as well. And um, yeah, I think that there were discussions for a long time about the importance of energy researchers. I'm certainly very thankful to be here um, helping to advocate for this. Um, as far as the student experience, um, you know, I you know, I really wasn't sure. Coming from a large institution like UMass, where there are really dedicated energy programs, I wasn't sure if you know students at a small school like Colby would be really focused on something as um, very specific as energy policy, but um, Students are really into this and they're seeing that there's massive growth. There are so many jobs in this field right now. 
And I think that this generation of students is very committed to solving the climate crisis. Every day that I come to work, I'm increasingly inspired. Um, you would think that in this field, we might be depressed all the time, but I'm inspired every day by my students. They're, um, they're so passionate and they're, they're doing the right things and they're gonna solve this problem um, with us. So I'm really encouraged by that. I know that wasn't exactly your question, but um, very, I'm very excited. You know, you see these, we're always sort of lamenting the, the next generation coming up. And um, I couldn't be more excited about this generation of students that has, liter has actually grown up um, with climate change as being part of their education from, you know, very early on, right? That was not part of my education early on. Um, it was something I sort of learned about as I got older. And, but that's not true with the current students. And um, they're really looking for solutions and they're change makers. It's good news for, for the students of Colby and for all of Maine to have this, uh, this kind of expertise cultivated right at the very beginning of, of the next generation of, of careers and just super exciting. And Penn, glad to have you on today. Uh, what I just want to say, first of all, I have a list of like a thousand questions and we're not going to get to all of them. That's probably always true, but I want to thank everybody who took the time to, to formulate some really thoughtful questions. I'm going to skip to, uh, to the last one on our list to say, what else are you working on? As if solving an offshore wind isn't, uh, isn't enough. <laughs> sure. Um so for those of you that have questions that were not answered that are you know, burning questions that you'd really like to engage in dialogue about, I've put my email. Um, oh, maybe, I guess you can't see that anymore. I had my email on one of the slides. I, I guess maybe that can get shared when you send around sort of your recap email, if that's a thing. Um, but my email is allison.bates at colby.edu. Very happy to chat with anyone. Um, yeah, I'm looking at different aspects of the energy transition. Um, one area that I'm working on, I, I sit on the board of the Energy Transition Institute, um, which is uh, based in Massachusetts. And in that I'm leading a project on developing energy equity metrics. And we're working with a number of um, low income and minority populations to identify how energy intersects with inequality. And if we're going to uh, like, how do we actually measure this so that we can build that into the framework of what the Department of Energy is actually um, incentivizing right now? Because we're seeing massive investments, um, many millions of dollars of investments in both National Science Foundation, Department of Energy initiatives um, for renewables. So how do we measure and how do we account for really what's important um, uh, for a just energy transition? Uh, I'm also working on a project on um, solar energy. So I'm very interested in how um, solar energy is incentivized into rural communities, which is very relevant here in Maine. You know, we often have tra large tracts of forested land or maybe not, or maybe farmland um, that can be very attractive to develop um, for solar PV. And that can sometimes be at odds with goals of communities. And so investigating, you know, how communities would like to see solar build out and what are the ways that we can proactively um, identify the, the benefits to our rural communities um, before um, communities are sort of put into the backseat in a reactive position. So um, trying to help um, communities build you know, sort of solar plans and identify how they'd like to see that growth is something that I've been working on. It sounds like we might have to have a, a few more lunch and learns with you because I want to know about all of those projects. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing so much uh, fascinating information and just that big picture perspective that is absolutely crucial as we wrestle with these tough decisions and, and hard work ahead. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We are off next week ahead of the July 4th holiday. So I hope you'll join us the following week on July 9th for a conversation with David Reedmiller, who is the director of the new Climate Center at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Also, it has come to my attention that when I plugged Dr. Brady's 
presentation on later in July. I miss said his name. So please join us for Dr. Brady later in the month and wildlife impacts of offshore wind. We're going to talk about the ocean all summer. What, what could be better? Uh, I hope in the meantime that you get out and enjoy the ocean, maybe not on the rainy day, but you know, we'll have, have a good weekend. Have a great holiday. We'll see you again on July 9th. Thanks so much.